My first story is about a 76-year-old woman. Her name is Barbara. Barbara worked all her life, 50 years or something like that, before retiring in her own home, a home that she owns in Chicago that she bought long before housing prices you know, skyrocketed in Chicago. She worked, not making a whole lot of money, but she lives in not the best neighborhood either, right? And so she owns this home. She owns a two-flat building, which is sort of Chicago's way. I don't know if you're familiar with that term of saying a two-story building that has two separate apartments in it. So Barbara lives on the first floor in her own unit. She has a kitchen, you know, a full house there. And then she has a second floor that she rents out for a little extra income. She also lives, you know, on a fixed income. She has her social security payment, and then whatever little bit of money that she was able to save while she was working and raising a family. Barbara raised a family. She has two adult daughters. Her oldest daughter's name is Keisha. Keisha has two teenage daughters of her own. At some point, Barbara allowed Keisha and her two teenage daughters to move back in with her in the second floor. They had been sort of bounced around from place to place, not really having a whole lot of housing stability, and they'd just been kicked out of Keisha's boyfriend's home. So they needed a place to go, so Barbara takes them in, lets them move into the second floor. Now, again, Barbara's on a fixed income, so the agreement is that Keisha's going to help out around the home. Um, she's going to pay rent, a little bit of money every month, and she's also going to help take care of Barbara because Barbara's getting older. She needs someone to help her with her medications, run errands, that kind of thing. So for a little while, things are going fine. Uh, Keisha pays her first month's rent, Things seemed to be okay, but pretty quickly, things turn. And Barbara knew this all along, that this is kind of how Keisha, Keisha operates. Keisha has a substance abuse problem. She abuses drugs and alcohol. And she has sort of an anger issue problem. She often gets violently angry with her two teenage daughters. She throws them out of the house, locks them out on a regular basis. Um, she destroys property in the home, refuses to allow Barbara to come into her apartment to fix things or to send repairmen up there. She has strange people over at all hours um, doing who knows what, and, and it scares Barbara. So one day, Keisha has thrown her two teenage daughters out into the street. It's cold, it's snowing. Barbara takes them in, says, you can stay here with me for a while. She's done this lots of times before. This time, Keisha finds out and when she finds out, she's furious that Barbara has taken in her daughter. So she's turned out to teach them a lesson, right? So she comes down, she bangs on Barbara's door, she's banging on the windows, like, saying, you have to throw these kids out, right? She's demanding to be let in, demanding that, that Barbara play along with this lesson she's going to teach her kids. Barbara ignores this. She doesn't open the door. She, she, wasn't, she won't respond to Keisha. Keisha became, becomes furious. She threatens to kill Barbara. She bangs the doors. She bangs the windows, eventually she goes away. This goes on for a period of days. This, this happens several times. One day, Barbara's out running errands or whatever. She's at the store. She comes home. They have a common entryway. They, they both go in the front, same front door that leads to the street, and you know, Keisha can go up to her apartment. Barbara can go to hers. She meets Keisha at the entryway, and Keisha's still fuming. She demands that Barbara turn her daughters back out into the street and, and you know, start swearing at her, how dare you do this kind of thing, I hate you, you always treated me badly. She threatens again to kill Barbara, and this time she pushes her down and she kicks her while she's down. So Barbara calls the police, of course Keisha takes off, the police come for the umpteenth time they respond to Barbara, and they can't make an arrest because Keisha's gone, Right? So, but they say, you know, we'll keep responding to you, we'll keep helping you, but you've got to do something. You've got to get some help. I want to tell you a story about Jose. Jose's nine years old. He's a Hispanic boy. And if I told you all of the things that Jose had experienced in his brief life, you wouldn't believe it. When Jose was only seven, his mother's boyfriend, who lived in his home, sexually assaulted him. And Jose didn't tell anyone. The only way this came out is he was riding the school bus, and the school bus driver noticed a crowd of kids kind of giggling around Jose. And he goes back there, and he takes from Jose a picture that Jose has drawn. It's really sexually graphic. And Jose's seven. So he takes this to the principal, and the principal calls the teacher in. The teacher says, you know, that kind of makes sense. Jose's been acting out sexually in class, too. So the school calls Child Protection Services, in Illinois, we call them DCFS. It's the Department of Children and Family Services. They launch an investigation into Jose's home life. They go, and their investigation reveals that Jose's mother's boyfriend, who lives in the home, 
yeah, he's sexually assaulted Jose, and he's done it many times. It goes like this, Jose goes to bed, Jose's mother's boyfriend comes in, gets into bed with Jose, and makes him do unspeakable things. And this happens regularly, and Jose's mom knows about it, and she's part of it. Who knows what's going on with them, who knows what sort of mental health issues they face, or substance abuse things, but needless to say, this is not a safe situation for a seven-year-old boy. So child protection removes him from the home right away, they put him into foster care. In Illinois, at least, and probably everywhere, we have not really a preference, but if we can disrupt the child's life as little as possible, we'll do that by putting them with family members. So it's sort of an extended stay with family members. Hopefully the family can get services to reunify. So Jose goes with his maternal aunt, so it's his mom's sister, and he's living with her for a while. Things seem to be okay. Mom gets arrested, um, and mom's boyfriend is arrested. Mom's boyfriend is arrested, charged, convicted. He's in prison, right? He's not coming out. Mom, though, she, there's not enough evidence against her. Her case gets thrown out. But the judge does enter an order. It's a no-contact order. You can't have any contact with Jose for a period of time. So things are going okay, but, but uh, Aunt, the foster mom, won't really cooperate with the services that are being offered. And so eventually, you know, Jose wants this too. He's removed from that home and put into another foster home. The longer he stays there, the more comfortable he gets with that family. Things slowly start coming out about his home life, what was going on there, and even what was going on with the aunt. Turns out the aunt is allowing Jose to have all this contact with mom, despite the court order that says no. She's letting him go over there, stay over there, unsupervised, and he tells things that when he's there, strange men come into the home and touch him in his private place. Right, so all this awful stuff is happening to Jose in his home, but also the system kind of failed Jose. Jose needs a voice, needs someone to step in for him. One more story. This is about Lynn. Lynn is from China. She's lived in Chicago for about a year. Um, she doesn't speak a whole lot of English. She reads and writes a little bit better, but she's, she's not very conversant in English. She speaks Mandarin. Lynn came to the United States with her husband, Grady. Grady is an American citizen. You see, Lynn really wanted to come to the States. She has a 13-year-old boy that she wanted to bring to America. Lynn, Lynn had a rough life in China. I don't know exactly what happened or what she was exposed to, but for whatever reason, she really wanted to come to the United States and raise her son in the United States, at least from 13. So she gets connected to a mail-order bride service, and she meets Grady this way. Grady pays for her to come to the United States. He flies over to China, he marries her, and he brings her back. Now, Grady is this, he's a probation officer in Chicago. He's uh, this big, sort of hulking man, sort of a scary guy. But Lynn, Lynn really wants to come here. I don't know if she's blinded by her desire to come to the United States or whatever, but she, she comes, she brings her son over. When she's here, she sort of quickly realizes what Grady's really like. He's very angry, especially it comes out with her son. Grady doesn't have any kids of his own. He sort of tries to te treat Lynn's son like, it's, like he's his son, and you know, he doesn't speak much English. He's learning. He's picking up pretty quickly, but he doesn't speak a whole lot of English, and so sometimes school is hard for him. So he brings back homework you know, that's not done well or bad grades, and Grady's furious, and he, he hits him. He's, he, Slaps him across the kitchen. He yells at him. He calls him derogatory names. If Lynn tries to intervene, she gets hit too. And Lynn is Grady's property as far as he's concerned. He's paid for her to come here. He's doing this for her. She, she belongs to him. So she better do what he says. She better obey him. And if she doesn't, she gets beat, raped. She gets locked into the house for days on end while Grady's gone. One day, Grady's home alone with Lynn's 13-year-old son. He's come home. He's brought home a bad grade or something like that. And Grady lost it. He got a broomstick and just started beating the kid. The kid's got bruises all over his face and all over his body. And he carries around with him this translating device, this little electronic translation device that he always has. And he records the whole thing on the device. And he plays it back for his mom. 
By the grace of God, his mom gets connected to some Chinese-American church in Chicago, and, she, and they, they try to help her and get her connected to services and say, you've got to do something. You've got to seek legal help. Well, good morning. Sort of a, a heavy way to start the day, right? Uh, I want to revisit the stories of Barbara, Lynn, and Jose in a few minutes, but first I just want to say thank you. Thank you for letting me come back here to my alma mater and speak to you about justice and courage, two things that are really important in the work that I do today and have been hugely influential in shaping who I am and, and what I do. It wasn't too long ago that I sat right there, like Dr. Hall and Dr. Bass just said, in those pews, uh, filling out those same chapel cards and getting my 10, my ten uh, chapel credits, so hopefully I can, I can do that for you. Um, I graduated from Carson Newman in 2003. Today, I live in Chicago, where I'm a public interest attorney. Excuse me. What I mean by that is I'm an attorney who tries to help people, <laughs> help people who can't afford access to an attorney otherwise. Public interest attorneys believe in equal access to justice regardless of class, income, place in society, that kind of thing. We believe that the court system and, and justice is not just owned by the privileged few, but should be accessible to everyone. And so we work to do those things. I've done several different things uh, since being a public interest attorney. The first was representing uh, seniors, victims of elder abuse, like Barbara. I also represented victims of domestic violence, like Lynn. And today I represent kids in foster care, like Jose. Today I work for the Office of the Public Guardian in Cook County. I represent minors. Um, age, age newborn to 21. So in Illinois, we go all the way up to 21 if you're in foster care. We represent them. These are kids who have been removed from their homes because of the abuse and neglect that they've faced in their home, and the state has, has decided this is not safe for them. We've got we've to take them out and give them some safety. Hopefully, in an ideal situation, the family can receive services that they need to sort of educate them on why this isn't safe for kids, whatever they need to reunify with, with their families, and then at some point the, the families can come back together and be stronger for it. Now, of course, that doesn't always happen. So, you know, the next sort of fallback is to try to find safe homes for these children where they can be provided some sort of permanency, whether it's they, they get adopted into that home or guardianship can be provided or something like that. That doesn't always happen either, you know, depending on the kid's age and level of special needs and that kind of thing. So in those situations, we try to find... Uh, we try to prepare those kids for independence as best as possible. And the child can actually start preparing for independence at 15, if you can imagine when you were 15 trying to pull together all the things it would take to live your life on your own. But I'm here to talk to you about not just what I do, but why I do it, about the concepts of justice and courage, things I feel really strongly about. Like Dr. Bass said, I was asked in preparation for this, for a sense of my calling, my mission, my purpose. And, and again, like it was just said to you, as a Christ follower, I do take seriously that our God is a God of justice, and that's something that we need to be pursuing too. That's something I have to be about. So I want to talk to you about justice and courage, and I want to do that through sort of the lens of my story, and that's not because I somehow think that my story is something you should pattern your life after or that I've somehow arrived. I mean, far from that, of course, but just because, obviously, it's the story that I know. And I think that I've seen a lot of interesting things in my life, and so I want to share those things with you, too, but also just talk to you about sort of about why I do that and about those concepts. I want to talk to you about three things today. So you can write these down if you're following along. Uh, first is, why should we pursue justice? Why is that important? The next is, what it means to pursue justice. What does that look like? Not only why should we be doing it, but okay, so what, what, is, what does that mean? And then finally, having the courage it takes to be involved in justice seeking. <clears throat> so first I want us to start with sort of <coughs> a working definition of justice. From my perspective, I work with people who are impoverished or who have been marginalized, victimized, um, and don't have much of a voice of their own, and so it's my job to advocate for them, to be their voice in a system that's foreign and confusing for them. We call that social justice. Um, and so I want to I talk to you about what does social justice mean? 
Bart Kimpolo, um, who, by the way, is someone who was hugely influential in my life journey. And if you're at all interested in concepts of justice, especially in an urban setting, I would recommend reading, he has a, a book called Kingdom Works. It's just stories of people living in the city and, and loving their neighbors, that kind of thing. It's a really great book. It's a simple read. But um, he says this, that social justice, as I understand it, is when everybody gets what he or she truly needs in order to realize his or her fullest potential as a lover of God and as a lover of other people. So let's go with that, right? Everyone getting what they need to recognize their fullest potential. At its most basic, that's what justice is. And whenever someone stands in the way of someone getting what they need, that's injustice. And so we fight against that. So why should Christians be about this thing called justice? Why should we as Christ followers care? Well, for one, and sort of at the base here, is that God loves justice. I don't have to tell you that. You know that if you know any concepts about God at all. You know that he's a just God. He comes to the rescue of the oppressed and the poor. I mean, it's throughout scripture. I'll just, I'll just point to a couple of places. In Psalm 10, verses 17 through 18, it says, O Lord, you will hear the desire of the meek. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice for the orphan and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. And Psalm 35, verse 10, puts it this way. It says, O Lord, who is like you? You deliver the weak from those too strong for them. You rescue the weak and the needy from those who despoil them. So God cares about justice. He also cares very deeply about the poor. And this is sort of important to me. There's hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible that talk about you know, God's special concern for the poor. And I, I read some story about a guy who, who actually cut out all the verses in the Bible, like just like, took them out with an X-Acto knife or something, and that, to talk about God's special concern for the poor. And you're left with a Bible that's completely unreadable because it's all the way through Scripture. Ron Sider, who, again, is another man who's been hugely influential to me, read his books. You've probably read some of them, uh, Just Generosity or Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. You should check out those books again if you're interested. Um, he's also the president of an organization called Evangelicals for Social Action. And he says that it's not because God cares more about the poor than other people. It's just that he cares so deeply about all people. And the poor's needs are so pronounced because of their abuses they've faced or their own poor choices or victimization that they've encountered that he wants all people to come to wholeness. And, and, and for that reason, the poor are of special concern to him because of, of the barriers particularly, that they face. So if God cares so deeply about justice and has a special concern for the oppressed and the victimized, we should too. So God cares about justice, but also Jesus cares about justice. In, in his first public address, he talks about this is his mission, justice. In Luke 4, 16 through 21, it says, and I'll just read this to you, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. Everyone turns to look at him, and he says... The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this day. In his first public address, he identifies justice as his mission, and he identifies with the poor. Throughout his life, he does the same. He's born in a stable after his mom rides for miles on a donkey. The first people to know about its birth are the shepherds, who are sort of the least of these, right? And then his whole life, he's kind of a wandering nomad. He says in Matthew 8 that, you know, even foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. In fact, Jesus loves justice so much that he thinks it's at the heart of inheriting eternal life. He gets asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Sounds like a simple enough question, but it's a lawyer who asks him that question. Right? And you can't trust lawyers. And I really should know some more lawyer jokes. I always tell my wife that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn these lawyer jokes so I can sort of front them so that people aren't like telling me these jokes first, but I don't really know very many. Um, 
I do know one, and I'll tell you right one, my one joke. So this is sort of a pause in the, in the lecture here. I'll tell you this joke. A barber is cutting a preacher's hair. He's giving him a haircut. When he's done, the preacher says, you know, he goes to pay for the haircut, and the barber says, no, no, you do the work of God. It's on me. So the next morning, he finds a, twi- a stack of 12 Bibles outside his door. It's a gift from the preacher. Next day, he's cutting a policeman's hair, and the policeman goes to cut, pay for his haircut, and he says, no, no, you're out protecting the public. This is on me. So the next morning, he finds a dozen donuts at his door. <laughs> the next day, he's cutting a lawyer's hair. The lawyer goes to pay for his haircut. The guy says, no, no, you're serving our justice system. Haircut's on me. The next morning, he finds 12 more lawyers at his doorstep asking for a free haircut. <laughs> All right. Kind of a dumb joke. I should probably learn some better ones. But anyway, so back to the story. So the lawyer asks him this question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what do the scriptures say? And the man knows the scriptures, and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yeah, do that, and you'll, and you'll live. And he says, who's my neighbor? And that's when Jesus tells this story that everybody knows. We're all familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. A man's riding down the road. He gets attacked. He's beat up. He's robbed. He's left dying in a ditch on the side of the road. And a preacher comes by. He's on his way to church. He sees the man dying there, and he keeps going. He doesn't stop. And another guy from the church, let's say a worship leader, comes by. He sees him dying in the side of the road. He keeps going. He doesn't stop. Then a Samaritan stops by. He sees him there. He can't ignore him. He's compelled to act. He gets down off his donkey. He walks over to him. He's cleaning him up. He takes him to an inn. He pays for the man, and he says, whatever else you have to pay to to make sure that he's okay, I'll do it. Now, in that story, you know, it's it's significant, of course, that, that Jesus chooses a Samaritan. Um, You probably know this, but the Samaritans were descended from the Assyrians who had centuries earlier conquered Israel and beaten, pillaged, and raped the survivors. And then they they fathered children in that land, and and they were called the Samaritans. And the Jews who came back hated those people, and they reminded them of their enslavement and the injustices they faced. But Jesus chose a Samaritan here to be the justice seeker. Okay, so that's a little bit of why we should choose to do justice, why it's important. Let's talk about what does it mean to, produce, to pursue justice. So let's go back to that definition we talked about. I'll just read it for you again. It's when everybody gets what he or she truly needs in order to realize his or her fullest potential as a lover of God and as a lover of other people. So justice is about making sure people get what they need. It's beyond compassion. You know, in the story of the Good Samaritan, compassion is what gets the Samaritan down off his donkey or whatever and and brings him there. But justice is what keeps him there. He keeps at it. He doesn't just sort of get the guy back on the road or whatever. He's he's making sure that all his needs are met, his bills are paid, everything's in place to have him fully restored. I think that's a little bit of what justice is about. Back in 2002, when I was uh, a junior here at Carson Newman, I spent a summer in Chicago working for an organization called the Center for Student Missions. I eventually went back there and became a director for a couple of years, but that summer was huge for me. I spent the summer um, just, just volunteering with soup kitchens and homeless shelters and children's programs and different places, social service agencies around Chicago. And I got to see a lot of people doing a lot of great things. Um, and that, you know, I got, to, I got to be, I got to meet a lot of people who were in great need and sort of deliver compassion and, and get shown compassion myself. Then, then I went back, like I said, and, and spent a couple of years there, and, and I, I sort of thought, you know, I've got to do something more, and this is what I'm being called to do. And so I went to law school, and that's why I became a public interest attorney. Justice is about righting wrongs, not just covering up symptoms, not just, not just administering compassion, though there's nothing wrong with that that's, that's hugely important, but justice is about getting at the root of what's causing this person to be in pain, what's causing the wrong in their life. Finally, I want to talk to you about the courage it takes to be involved in justice seeking. 
We've already talked about the fact that we must be involved in justice seeking. It's core to, to who we are if you call yourself a Christ follower. We're to be involved in what he's about, and we, we in fact can't call ourselves followers of Christ, I believe, without being about those things. But we must also have the courage to do those things of justice, to stand up to the big guy and those, do those things that Christ would do despite the cost, the controversy, or the confrontation we're likely to get ourselves into. The courage it takes from knowing that we're on the side of right. So when a husband hits his wife and continues to confine her to her home in an effort to control her, we need to step in and say, no, that's not right. Despite the fact that that guy's bigger than you are. When someone much bigger than us attempts to push around the low-income renter who has nowhere else to go and extort them, we need to step in and say, I'm not going to allow that to happen. We, in a position to do that, in a position of hopefully a little bit of a, of a, a more, a place where we can afford to do that kind of thing, we need to step in and say, no, that's not right, and have the courage to stand up for what is right and advocate for people who've been victimized for too long. But on top of the courage it takes for us to stand up in places where someone bigger than us maybe is pushing someone around, we also need to recognize and honor the courage that it takes for victims to step up as well and to say, no. That first step is huge. I, I heard that, especially, I've, I've worked with victims of domestic violence for several years, and victims attempt to leave their abuser seven times before it actually sticks, before they can actually leave. On that first step out, on that first time when they say no, then we need to sweep in and say, and be the feet for those people who can't stand on their own, right? And that's just an example of domestic violence, but there's hundreds of examples of that kind of thing. When people ha don't have a voice, have the courage to advocate for that person, to be the voice that they need. I wanna revisit those stories that we talked about a few minutes ago of Barbara, Lynn, and Jose. Barbara came to the Legal Aid Bureau where I was working and sought an order of protection against her daughter. I represented Barbara in a trial against her own daughter. Barbara was afraid. She was ashamed. I mean, she'd made mistakes, and this was her daughter, and she was, she was really nervous to be going into a trial against her daughter, as understandably, I think. And she often wanted to back down. But in the end, the judge granted Barbara an order of protection that kept Keisha away from Barbara. I and mean, she couldn't have any contact with her. And if she violated that order, she can call the police. They can enforce those orders. That's the benefit of an order of protection in Chicago. You probably have something similar in Tennessee. We also sought an eviction and had Keisha evicted from the home for violations of her lease, for not paying rent, for damaging property, that kind of thing. Totally sad situation all the way around, but Barbara was safe. Jose... He's still in foster care. He's currently in a pre-adoptive home, though. I just saw him a couple of weeks ago, and he's, he's doing really well. Of course, he has lots of issues, and he's going to have those issues. You can't face that sort of, those sort of abuses without suffering some sort of um, repercussions. But he's in therapy. He has a therapist that he meets with weekly, sort of a play therapist. He talks to his school social worker. He's receiving supports, and he has a family that loves him. In fact, he has a little sister, Eileen. Eileen's nine months old. She was born after Jose was removed from the home, and in, in Illinois, we have this thing called anticipatory neglect, where if one child has been injured in the home, we don't have to wait for the other child to be injured. If it's such a risky situation, we can take that child out too, and in this situation, it was pretty egregious, so Eileen came out. Jose is Eileen's biggest defender. He protects her, loves her, plays with her, she is part of his restoring process. I represent Jose, and in fact, we're going back in just a few weeks in, uh, to court, and hopefully we're moving toward permanency with this new home. They're willing to, to adopt him. His mother still has rights at this point. She needs a lot of help of her own um, and, and probably isn't able to take Jose back in a safe way. And finally, Lynn. Lynn had a wonderful translator that she met through her church. And Lynn also came uh, to the Legal Aid Bureau where I was working at the time, and the three of us worked together to bring a case against her husband, Brady. Lynn's biggest fear was that 
Grady, I'm sorry. Grady was sponsoring her citizenship, right? So he, he was sponsoring her citizenship application, and he would use that against her all the time, threatening to withdraw her application or to pull his sponsorship so that she would be undocumented and she'd be deported. We have this great thing, though. It's a federal act called the Violence Against Women Act. And if you've been victimized by a citizen who's, who's particularly if they're sponsoring your, your citizenship, you can apply for citizenship without their knowledge. So she did that for her and her son. Today, they're enjoying the benefits of US citizenship. And they're safe and away from Grady. He doesn't know where they are. My challenge to you today is to get involved in justice seeking. Now, not everyone can or should make justice seeking a part of their career. We obviously need people to do varieties of things. But we all should make it a part of our lives. And there's little ways and big ways that we can be involved in seeking justice and having the courage to do so every day. Find a way to get involved. Research issues that you particularly care about. Pray about those things. And maybe it's advocating for a morally just budget on a national level, on a local level, a budget that takes into uh, concern the needs of the poor. Maybe it's working on issues of immigration right here in Jefferson City, in East Tennessee. We have lots of migrant workers who are treated unfairly sometimes. Maybe it's, maybe it's taking that on. Maybe it's advocating for those people who are in a strange and foreign land. Maybe it's big issues like sex trafficking or child soldiers or lonely and neglected senior citizens or illiterate adults or whatever it is. Find a way to get involved. And find a way to get involved now. I know Carson Newman, I, like Dr. Bass said, one of my biggest things was, was being a Bonner Scholar. I saw a Bonner Scholar up there. Yeah. Um, that's a great way of being involved. Of course, we all can't do that. But there's so many community service options here in Jefferson City and, and in our surrounding neighborhoods to be involved in things, even if it's just getting to know a kid who needs a friend, who needs a parent figure, who needs an adult to, to sort of pattern life for them. So get involved, whatever it is, research, research it and pray for those things you can't directly impact, but get involved today. I just want to say thank you again for letting me be here today, and, and hopefully you know, I'll be able to stick around, or maybe you can get in contact with me some way if you have any questions, but thank you and God bless you.